For the final video of 2023, we have something very special. High Speed Rail Explained is back, and today we get to cover a personal favorite of mine, the UK. While the UK gets a lot of flack for some well-publicized high-speed rail conundrums and misfires, which we will of course talk about, the country actually also has a lot of fast trains. Those fast trains mean you can get across the country quite quickly, and the UK has a lot of high-speed history. So let's talk about fast trains today and the future of high-speed rail in the UK. Welcome to RM Transit, a channel with explainers of transit systems from Japan to Spain and the UK. The UK was early to the fast train game with the Mallard Steam Locomotive, a train which I used to have on a poster in my bedroom as a child. Being capable of hitting 125 miles per hour, faster than many intercity trains even today, it also highlights something else which makes the UK so interesting for rail in general. The restrictive loading gauge, that is the tight train profiles, mean that train models operated in the UK tend to be distinct from much of the rest of the world. In the mid-20th century, the UK was racing forwards to high-speed rail alongside other countries like France with the APT, that is the advanced passenger train prototype initially planned to use a gas turbine just as with the earliest TGV plants. While the APT never saw the success of the TGV program, it did lead to a lot of useful research which helped push high-speed rail forward. For much of the late 20th century, the approach to high-speed trains in the UK, which depending on who you ask, generally don't meet the bar for true high-speed, was largely piecemeal upgrade programs of existing lines, which meant various speed-ups along the routes. This upgrade-based approach did however mean mostly limiting top speeds to the 125 mph Mallard had long since hit. That being said, 125 miles per hour is not exactly slow. It's much faster than motorway speeds, and in a country as small as the UK, it actually proves pretty practical. Major upgrade programs started in the late 20th century when the Great Western Main Line was upgraded for use with the HST, also known as the Intercity 125. These trains are easily one of the most iconic ever conceived, and emerged as an alternative to the APT during its development. The HST is a fast conventional train with two powerful and yet lightweight diesel locomotives that allowed it to hit and surpass 125 miles per hour as per its name. The trains were so successful that a few are still in use today four decades on. The HST design was even exported to Australia where the significantly modified XPT trains still operate on long distance services. Later on, the East Coast Main Line was upgraded and this came alongside another train, the Intercity 225, which was capable of 225 kilometers per hour or 140 miles per hour. The 225 was actually the descendant of the APT and unlike the HST, featured a single electric locomotive. Unfortunately though, despite the train and geometry on the East Coast Main Line technically allowing for 140 mile per hour operation, the lack of better signaling limited its speed. And further along still, upgrades have happened to the Midland Main Line, which similarly have brought large sections up to 125mph speed limits. As the entire organization of the British railway system changed with privatization and franchising, the number of trains capable of 125mph, generally multiple units of various forms, exploded, though none have captured the same mindshare as the HST. Another train that really changed things for high-speed rail in the UK were the tilting Pendolino trains, which were introduced on the West Coast Main Line, finally allowing for 125 mile per hour speeds given the many curves along the route, which had previously limited train speeds to 110 miles per hour. These days, another sea change is happening with high-speed trains in the UK, with various trains from the Hitachi 800 series replacing the Intercity 125 and 225 trains. Some of these trains are pure EMUs, while others are bi-mode, allowing operation over non-electrified territory. They aren't the most popular, but hey, at least they look fast. Fortunately, the UK does have a modern purpose-built high-speed line known as High Speed 1, or the Channel Tunnel Rail Link, which at the time of its construction was the first new main line in a century. This line unsurprisingly connects the Channel and Kent to London though it didn't actually open with the channel, meaning trains initially had to take the conventional network to Waterloo. That meant the original TGV-derived rolling stock used on Eurostar services on the line had third rail shoes, the only example of a high-speed train with them that I'm aware of. These trains were also rather unique because they had to be able to split in half and operate separately for safety within the channel tunnel, and both because of the operation into Waterloo and because of the planned North of London services that never really happened, they had to be built to the restrictive British loading gauge. 
These days, Eurostar trains to the UK directly connect to not only Paris on France's northern high-speed line, which actually did open for the Channel Tunnel's opening, but also Brussels and Amsterdam over the Low Countries high-speed lines. Eventually, High Speed 1 started opening with Phase 1 in 2003, which took trains to just southeast of London and finally meant trains in the UK could hit up to 190 miles per hour. In 2007, the second phase of HS1 opened, with the extension of the High Speed Line into London with several long tunnels, the giant open box station at Stratford International, which doesn't have international trains, and St Pancras. Let me point out here that the yard used to maintain the Eurostar trains just north of Stratford at Temple Mills is totally nuts, with an underground connecting track which swings over Stratford International and drops down into the middle of it. HS1 is interesting for other reasons too. The line has the larger European loading gauge that could mean proper double-deck trains in the UK someday, at least on the Eurostar. Much like the major European base tunnels, it is worth noting that the high-speed services traveling through the tunnel don't travel at top speed, being limited to about 100 miles per hour, and that the tunnel is also used for freight and for shuttle trains which carry vehicles. HS1 was also largely designed and built with French signaling and standards. While the existence of the line is obviously a positive, not nearly enough services run, with far more high-speed trains traveling between Paris and Lyon than London and Paris, despite the latter being bigger cities which are closer together. Fortunately, not all trains that use HS1 are only for international travelers, as there are a number of 140 mph per hour Javelin high-speed commuter services run by Southeastern, which use rolling stock related to the newer 800 series Hitachis and have third rail pickups and a smaller loading gauge so that they can operate on conventional lines. At the same time, as is the pattern for a lot of modern infrastructure in the English-speaking world, HS1 feels overbuilt in a number of ways such as at Stratford International with its enormous box designed to handle Eurostar trains which don't stop there, the terminal at St Pancras, which is also just that, a terminal which doesn't allow for a natural extension of HS1 services further north including onto the well under construction HS2. And that brings us to HS2, which has been in the news a lot this year. Originally, HS2 was meant to be another modern high-speed line built to European loading gauge and with an eye-watering top speed of 225mph speeds only seen on the Tohoku Shinkansen and some lines in China, as well as in plans for the California high-speed rail line, connecting between London, Birmingham, as well as Leeds and Manchester, with further services continuing on the conventional lines all the way up to Scotland. High Speed 2 was set to be the world's most expensive high speed rail line, and the situation in London was also filled with tunnels as with HS1, with a massive underground station at Old Oak Common currently under construction and a large underground terminal at Euston hanging in the balance. It does seem bad to me that despite all of this tunneling, far in excess of other similar lines in continental Europe, that there still won't be through high speed rail service through London, allowing a single seat journey from Kent to the north and high-speed trains won't even terminate at the same location in London, requiring a tube ride or a fairly long walk for a transfer to connect. As you may have heard, HS2 went through quite a slash and burn this year, with the government cancelling the northern leg to Manchester, the leg to Leeds having been cut some time before, as well as bizarrely the leg into central London. If you're wondering where things will go, the government has suggested they would invest these savings into other transport projects, which embarrassingly includes projects that have already been built and lots of roads. All of this means for now, HS2 as it's being built will connect from the aforementioned massive underground station at Old Oak Common, which will be connected to central London with an expanded Elizabeth Line service to a new terminal at Curzon Street in Birmingham which is on the edge of the city centre and will be connected by an under construction extension to that city's light rail system. It seems that the line will be extended to Euston, albeit with a more modest design for the station than originally planned, with 6 rather than 11 terminating platforms, which has raised concerns about capacity, though it would probably be good to note at this point that the Tokaido Shinkansen does manage to run high speed services every few minutes despite also having 6 terminating platforms in Tokyo. As part of the cancellation of large parts of HS2, the large order of trains for the project are also hanging in the balance. The trains, which would be similar to the ETR 1000 that runs on the Italian high-speed rail network, will be built by a consortium of Alstom and Hitachi, building on earlier work by Bombardier and Hitachi on the trains for Italy. They'll also be compatible with operation on the conventional network, which is critical as HS2 has only been further pared down, and will be delivered in 200 meter sets which can be coupled together to form 400 meter trains on HS2. 
Despite all of the cancellations and uncertainty, HS2 is moving forward, and even in its scaled back form, it will be a hugely positive project that expects to start operating services from around 2030, allowing passengers to save about half an hour in journeys between Birmingham and Manchester and London. While these travel time savings might not seem earth-shattering, much like on the Tokaido Shinkansen, much of the motivation between the construction of HS2 is increasing capacity by moving fast services off of the capacity-constrained and already maxed out on speed upgrades legacy lines to the north, to enable more lower-speed regional and freight services to operate, which will make better use of the legacy lines. So what does the future hold for high-speed rail in the UK then? Well, I think much of the near term will be spent reckoning with the foolish decisions being made with HS2 today. Clearly further extensions north will eventually need to be built, and hopefully these can be designed, unlike the plans that were cancelled, to better enable more upgrades and extensions further north in the future. It's also a bit of a personal dream, but I also think a cross-city high-speed tunnel in London should be built at some point, to allow high-speed trains to cross the capital and increase capacity. Such a tunnel would probably connect to Old Oak Common and Stratford Domestic on either side, and would probably require a super long mine station under central London. But it would also probably be worth it through increased capacity and better connectivity. While HS2 was still properly moving ahead, there was also lots of talk about Northern Powerhouse Rail, a plan to connect Liverpool, Manchester, and Leeds up with an east-west high-speed line in the north, which has been essentially cancelled. While such a project would still make a ton of sense, I think advocacy energy will likely be focused more on HS2 for the foreseeable future. There's also room for a bit more upgrading of the existing network, and there will inevitably be more upgrades across the nation in the coming decade. One such project that comes to mind is the East Coast Digital Program, which should finally enable the 140 mile per hour speeds that have long been planned on the East Coast mainline. Now, while this video might have ended on a bit of a sad note, reflective, I think, of the state of high-speed rail building in the UK these days, I do think it's good to reflect on what the UK does have, despite its limited true high-speed rail network. On the whole, the UK has succeeded in extending some level of fast train service to large parts of the country, and I think this goes to show that the model of upgrading legacy railways is not without its merits. While you don't get the same headline-grabbing speeds, you do get more coverage, better alignments, and station locations, and more of an uplift for existing services. The UK actually has long had the highest average train speeds in the world, and that's thanks to the extensive fast regional and long-distance services running on legacy lines. As many an armchair planner knows, average speeds often matter a lot more than top speeds. Thanks for watching. Thank you.